one evening. Woman was driving home. She noticed a huge truck behind her driving uncomfortably close. She stepped on the gas to gain some distance from the truck, but when she sped up, the truck did too. The faster she drove, the faster drove the truck. Now scared, she exited the freeway. The truck followed. The woman turned up a main street, hoping to lose her pursuer in the traffic. But the truck ran a red light and continued to chase. Reaching the point of panic, the woman whipped the car into a service station, bolted out of the car, screaming for help. The truck driver sprang from his truck and ran toward the car, yanked the back door open, and pulled out a man that was hidden in the back seat. The woman was running from the wrong person. From his high vantage point, the truck driver could see the would-be criminal in the woman's car. The chase wasn't his effort to harm her, but to save her at the peril of his own safety. But sometimes we run from God's provision his provision of atonement, his reckless pursuit of us, fearing, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to me if I become one of those Christians or one of those church people. But his plans are for good, not evil. He plans to rescue us from hidden sins that endanger our lives. God's amazing grace not only rescues the sinner from condemnation, but also from the slavery to that sin. God's unmerited favor, and that's what grace is, not only wipes the ledger clean and fills the ledger with Christ's righteousness, But he also takes what was a useless vessel, us, and fashions it into a trophy of his grace. I want to take this next half hour or so, and I want to focus on this small passage of scripture. The Apostle Paul gives this powerful statement and it is what every one of us can give if we are born again. That is if you there's a time in your life you say, you know what I'm an, I know I'm a sinner. I know that sin's enough to send me to hell, but Jesus paid that price on the cross. I'm going to ask him to save me. And guess what? He didn't save you because you were good enough. He didn't save you because you were smart enough. He didn't save you because you were good looking enough. He didn't save you because you were rich enough. He saved you in spite of who you are. He saved you because of his grace, his unmerited favor. Amen? And here's what Paul says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Oh, Lord, help us open our hearts to understand the power of this statement. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Apostle Paul writes this as an anthem of praise. It is God's grace not only that saves us from sin, but also that keeps us 
It is God's amazing grace that continues to work in us to fashion us to be made in the image of Christ. I'm so glad that our job, you know, when, when Jesus saved us, he didn't say, okay, here's a clean slate, now don't mess up again. If you mess up again, there's nothing I can do for you. Aren't you glad that God, God's grace that saved us is a... God's grace that saved us is the same grace that keeps us. In fact, the Bible says... If you trusted in Christ, it shows that he knew ahead of time that you would. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed. That means pressed into the mold to conform to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Guess what? By the grace of God, I am what I am. I am becoming more and more like Christ every day. You say, you're bragging. No, I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Jesus. I'm bragging on the one who made the mold and knows how to use it and pressure and squeeze and heat and, and fashion me to make me like Jesus. By the grace of God, I am what I am. How does this happen? How does God show his unmerited favor toward us and fashion us into a trophy of grace. What did Paul mean by this statement? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. We're just going to look. You know what, I'm not even going to try to holler over that. I'll just wait every time they come through. And by the way, when I get back, I'll bet you know what time it's going to be. Air conditioning time. But I decided to wait one more week for those of you who are thermically challenged. By the grace of God, I am what I am. What am I if I'm a born-again person? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not what I was. Now, you might say, Pastor, you've got fingerprints on your slide. Can anybody tell me what that, and, and I'll just tell you, I got it from Logos Bible Software when I typed in atonement. Can somebody tell me what those fingerprints are? Mm, no. Nope. All right, I'll tell you. All right, well, what if I say Day of, day of Atonement? Well, would you know then? Okay, the Day of Atonement. You had two, two sacrifices that would happen on the Day of Atonement. It happened every, you know what it is now, don't you? Um, two sacrifices. One, goat would the, the, the goat would be sacrificed, blood would be shed. And of course we know that that's a symbol of Christ's shed blood. But the other then, you dip, the, the priest would dip his fingers in the blood and put his handprint on the goat called the what? Scapegoat. And he would uh, release that scapegoat into the wilderness. That's the transference, my sins, to this goat. And this, this goat is now gone. Never again with me. I love that. My sins transferred on the innocent scapegoat. Never to bother me again. I am not what I was. What was I? I was dead in sin. You hath he quickened. That means made alive. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know what? Before I met Jesus, I was dead in my sin. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't wake myself up. I couldn't try to be good enough. I was dead. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'll tell you what I'm not. I'm not dead in my sin anymore. I'm not condemned in sin. Well, the Bible says before we meet Jesus, that's exactly what, what we are. He that believeth not on him, or I'm sorry, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is what? Condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Listen, did somebody say, yeah, but is there a way to get saved without believing in Jesus? No. Well, that's pretty exclusive. It's got to be your religion. Well, only Jesus is the one that died on the cross. It's not a matter of my belief at all uh, that, that somehow my belief merits it. It's what Jesus did, and my, my belief accesses God's unmerited favor. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'll tell you what I'm not anymore. I'm not dead in sin. I'm not condemned in sin. I'm not known by my sin anymore. You see, before Jesus, we start to be labeled by our sin. No, you're not. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusing themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It only takes one time to be uh, of committing that sin to be known by that sin. And if that's what you're known by, you're not going to get to heaven, not because you're not meriting heaven, but because you've not received the grace of God yet to exchange that sin. Listen. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Tell you what I'm not. I'm no longer a child of sin. Jesus had some very powerful words talking to the Pharisees. These are religious folks. You're of your father, the devil. You know what? Before Jesus, that is our spiritual father. You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Where When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is, a, he is a liar and the father of it. You know what? Before Jesus, before I got saved, before I asked Jesus to save me from my sin and take me to heaven, I was dead in sin. I was condemned, facing hell. I was known by sin. And I was a child of sin. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, how did all of that change? Well, it was by grace. Are you paying attention? <laughs> it was by grace, unmerited favor. Well, how does that work? You see, it's because of the great exchange. Jesus, like that scapegoat, Jesus became what I was. Well, what did Jesus become? Jesus didn't become sin, did he? Oh, yes, he absolutely did. Jesus became sin. For he hath, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Not just to pay the price for sin, but he became sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm not who I was, but Jesus became who I was. 
Jesus not only became sin, and we've looked at this verse many different times, Jesus was also condemned, like I was condemned. Before Jesus, I was condemned. Condemned already, the Bible says. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. Jesus became cursed. He became condemned. Did he sin? No. But was he condemned as a sinner? Yes. And here's something that blows my mind. One of the other things I was before I got saved, I was known by my sin. Did you know Jesus was known as a sinner? Think about it. Now, first of all, Jesus never sinned. We all get that, right? Look at this. He was known as... Jesus, the Lord of glory, was known as a transgressor, a sinner. Therefore will I divide a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He was known as a sinner. He was hung up with a couple of other thieves like all the rabble were. Before Jesus, I was known by my sin. Then Jesus came and completely took my place. He became my sin. He became my condemnation. He even was numbered with the transgressors. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm not what I once was. Jesus became what I once was. And now, Jesus is making me like he is. When I get to that point, and when you get to that point, if you've not done it, you can do it today to say, you know what? All of the efforts that I make in the world won't get me to heaven. But Jesus paid that price on the cross. I got it now. I'm going to quit trusting in myself. I'm going to quit trusting in my works. I'm going to quit trusting in my baptism. I'm going to quit trusting in my communion. I'm going to trust in what Jesus did when I ask him to save me in the heartbeat that he does, that you do that, he saves you, and then guess what happens? He starts, little by little, changing you from the inside out. Being confident in this very thing. He which hath begun a good work in you, by the way, you didn't begin the good work, he began the good work. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. People say, are you one of those folks who believe once saved, always saved? Listen, I didn't do anything to get myself saved. I'm certainly not going to do anything to keep myself saved. Jesus started the work. Jesus will finish the work. So now I am becoming like he is, the great exchange. What was I? I was dead in sin. What am I now? I'm alive to God. I was dead in sin. Now I'm alive. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon, or count it to be so, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
By the grace of God, I am what I am. What am I? I'm alive. You know what? There are folks who say, you don't want to get messed up with that religion stuff. It'll wreck your life. No, it'll give you life. Jesus gives you life. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. By the grace of God, I am what I am. What am I? I'm alive to God. What am I? Well, before, I was a child of the devil. Now, I'm a child of God. In Galatians chapter 4, in verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption. Here it is, the adoption of sons. Hey, the Bible uh, says, Jesus said, you're your father the devil, but he's willing to adopt us out of that dysfunctional family. What do you think? And because ye are sons, God has sent for the spirit of his son in your heart, crying, Abba, Father, and Abba, Father means Daddy. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant or a slave. You are a slave under your father, the devil. But now you're a son, and of a son, think about it, an heir of God through Christ. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is the son of God, the son of God, amen? But I can be adopted and become a son of God. What does that make me with Jesus? Brothers. Jesus is my brother? You know, you've heard about people who have a rich dad. If God is my adopted father, I would say I'm doing pretty good. You've not received a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, and then in verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. I am a Son of God. You are a child of God. If so be we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together with him. By the grace of God, I am what I am. What am I? I'm alive from the dead. I'm alive to God. What am I? I'm a child of God. What am I? I'm a trophy of God's grace. All of the universe can look at what God is doing in my life and in your life and give God the praise. Listen to what Paul said, there's a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. In a remote Swiss village stands a beautiful church, Mountain Valley Cathedral. It has high pillars, magnificent stained glass windows. But what makes it special is the most beautiful pipe organ in the whole region. People would come from far off lands just to hear this pipe organ play. One day, 
something went wrong with the pipe organ. When you, the player would play it, it was wrong tones, sounds of disharmony. Musicians and experts from all around the world tried to repair this once famous organ. No, no one could figure it out. It was made uniquely and it was customized, so no one really knew how to fix it. So folks gave up. After some time, the old man came. He, uh, an old man came into the church. Why is it this pipe organ being used? Oh, it sounds awful. It's not playing right. Well, can I look at it? No, the church staff reluctantly said, I guess, but man, we've had experts from all over the place looking. For two days, the old man worked in total silence. And the church worker uh, was getting a little nervous what this crazy old guy was doing back there. Then on the third day at noon, music came. The pipe organ gave off the best music after so many years. People in the village heard it echoing through that small town. They came running to the church to see. The old man was actually playing the organ. How did you fix it? How did you manage to restore this instrument when the world's experts couldn't do it? The old man said, I was the one that built it 50 years ago. I created it so I knew how to restore it. The heartbeat that you and I asked Jesus to save us from our sin. God begins the refurbishing work to bring us back into living and being the way he originally designed us to be. Sin destroyed this life. It's no longer good and perfect. It can't give out beautiful music. But God sent Jesus into the world to restore it, to give us an abundant life. He offers salvation as a free gift. Once you accept that gift, he continues to allow his unmerited favor to flow into your life, making you back into the perfect image of himself that you were created to be. Two questions. One, have you received that gift in the first place? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven because you've asked him to save you? Two, are you yielding to his work that he, he's going to make you like Christ one way or another? Are you letting him do what he needs to do? Are you following his lead? He's been telling you to show up to church more. Are you doing it? He's been telling you to, to, to raise your, your family in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, are you doing it? He's been telling you to read your Bible, are you doing it? He's been telling you to uh, tell other people about Jesus, are you doing it? Are you basking in the splendor of God's amazing grace?